<clears throat> Welcome everybody to Colloquia. Um, very excited to, to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Catherine Mayer. She was uh, an undergraduate here starting in 2000, I believe, at a college that's irrelevant. We don't need to talk about the college. Um, and she was a physics major. And then she stayed and did grad school here uh, and did her research in my group. And uh, this is sort of a way to sense molecules with nanoparticles. And people had kind of shown you could see a signal that Katie really studied carefully and showed you could actually see the right molecular interactions and sort of took it all the way to the single particle, single molecule levels. Those were the exciting things she did. But for the graduate students out there, she also wrote her thesis really well. And it was so clear that we made it into a review article that has like 3,000 citations. So you never know, someone might actually read your thesis if you write it really clear and carefully, you never know. Um, so when she graduated, she went and uh, did postdoc with Callie Willits at UT Chemistry, and then did another postdoc with uh, David Walt at Tufts, who's a big uh, pioneer in biomedical technology. And she's been at uh, uh, UTSA for, I guess, since 2014, and she's an associate professor now, and she's gonna tell us about uh, what she does then medical physics with nanoparticles. So take it away. Thank you, Jason. Um, and thanks so much for inviting me. I feel really happy and really honored to be giving colloquium at Rice. Um, let me go ahead and share my presentation with you guys one second. Are you guys able to see that? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So awesome. It's great to be virtually back at Rice. It's great to be talking to this audience. Um, I know, like I was saying before, there's a lot of grad students in the audience. So I hope that you guys will ask lots of questions. And uh, without further ado, let me get started. Okay, so um, first, I just want to give like a little overview of what all we do in my lab at UTSA. Um, so we have really like four main research areas that we do in my group. The first one is metal nanoparticles. We do a lot of synthesis, functionalization, bioconjugation of these different metal nanoparticles with proteins and other biomolecules, and then characterization of these, the nanoparticles as well as their bioconjugates. Uh, another area that we do a lot of work in is the physical properties of these nanostructures. So mainly we're interested in optical, cosmonic, and photothermal properties. Um, so I'll kind of refer back to that a little bit later on. The third area is kind of related to what Jason mentioned. Um, so I still do some work on single particle and single molecule techniques, including some optical imaging techniques and microwell array technologies. And then the fourth area that we do in my group and what I'm going to be focusing on today is really the medical applications of the gold nanoparticles that we make in my lab. Um, and in particular today, I'm going to be talking about one application in the field of medical physics. So um, I'm going to actually come at this a little bit backwards. I'm going to do my acknowledgments first um, because this is a really unique project. It's a collaborative project between UTSA and UT Health San Antonio. So we have my group that are the nanotechnology people, and then Dr. Neil Kirby's group. Um, he is a medical physicist over there in their cancer center. So I just want to really emphasize that this is a collaborative project. Um, and we've had some really great grad students who, again, I want to emphasize, are the ones who did the majority, majority of the actual work um, on the project that I'm going to show you. So we had uh, Tara Gray from UTSA, who's now graduated and is a resident in medical physics at the Cleveland Clinic, Nima Basiri, who's now a resident at UC Davis, and then Chaquan David, um, who is the senior grad student in my group now, who's carrying this project forward. And then we also had Devanti Patel, who was a real hotshot undergrad who worked on this project for uh, all four years that she was in college. And then um, a lot of other individuals at UTSA and UT Health were uh, involved in supporting this project. And then we had funding for this project from two different local foundations in San Antonio. So just wanna make sure uh, to get that out of the way um, at the very beginning. So uh, what I'm gonna go over in this talk 
First, I'm going to give some background on radiation therapy because I'm assuming that a lot of the students in the audience may not have um, background in medical physics. I certainly didn't when I got sucked into this project in the first place. So I'm going to just give some background that you're going to need to understand the rest of the talk. I'm going to tell you how do gold nanoparticles enhance radiation dose in radiation therapy. I'm going to go into some of the Monte Carlo simulations that we did to calculate this dose enhancement and then how we measured it, how we measured the physical macroscopic dose enhancement due to nanoparticles in the clinic. Then I'm gonna go into what we've been doing more recently, and that is highlighting the differences between a macroscopic radiation dose enhancement and then the microscopic dose enhancement, which is the really important one for understanding the radiobiological effects. So I'm gonna talk about how we're studying some of those radiobiological effects currently, and then in our ongoing work with in vitro studies. So that's kind of an overview of where, where I'm going to go. So like I said, I'm going to start off with some radiation therapy background. I apologize if this is super basic for some of you, but I have a feeling that most of the students probably um, don't have background in medical physics. And like I said, I didn't either when I first started. That's the great thing, by the way, about being a research professor. You get to learn new stuff all the time and learn new fields. So um, starting very basic. Radiation therapy, as you probably know, is used in the majority of all cancer cases in the United States. It's part of the gold standard of care for cancer treatment. Probably we all know um, at least one person, right, who has undergone radiation therapy. The basic principle, the basic principle of it uh, is pretty simple. The ionizing radiation in the form of X-ray photons um, either directly or indirectly damages the DNA of tumor cells. So either directly by impinging upon the DNA and breaking chemical bonds or indirectly by uh, entering the tissue, impinging on water molecules that then produce free radicals that go on to undergo chemical reactions, again, further damaging the tumor cells DNA. Now, unfortunately, this process is not specific to cancer cells, right? It's just x-rays going into tissue um, and damaging DNA that is equally likely to impact a normal cell as a cancer cell. There's nothing uh, special about cancer cells that um, makes them susceptible to this. Uh, however, over the past decades, medical physicists have come up with a lot of technological innovations to make the irradiation more precise. So they do image-guided therapy, they do patient-specific treatment planning, they do really sophisticated things with beam shaping and different kinds of collimators to try and uh, protect the surrounding healthy tissues as much as possible, right? However, um, it still is never gonna be perfectly targeted. And so there are still um, a lot of side effects that patients experience. And so the overall goal of these kinds of approaches that seek to enhance radiation therapy is to reduce the overall dose given to a patient. So our goal is to locally enhance the effects of the ionizing radiation so that a lower overall radiation dose may be used. That's our overall big long-term goal as to why we're pursuing this nanoparticle-based approach. Okay, so continuing on with a little more background, there's two main treatment modalities in radiation therapy. The first one, which is the uh, more famous one that probably everyone has heard of is um, external beam radiation therapy. So this is where um, the patient uh, lays on this table and um, is irradiated using a clinical linear accelerator or LINAC. This is used for many cancer types, mostly um, tumors that are deep seated within the body. And the energies um, with which they're irradiated are from four to 25 mega electron volts. So this is the higher energy range that we're looking at here. These are um, X-ray photons. And then the other modality that is maybe lesser known is called brachytherapy. And this is where radioactive seeds are placed uh, within the body proximal to the tumor location. Um, and this is commonly used for cancers, including cervical and prostate, where um, the tumor is like uh, within the pelvis, but it can also be used um, in different niche situations for all sorts of cancers, skin cancers, um, cancers of the eye. Um, and this uses 
photon energies in a slightly lower range from 20 to 1,000 kilo electron volts. So that's going to be important later. There's two flavors of brachytherapy. There's what's called low dose rate, which is where the radioactive seeds, um, which are small, they're around the size and shape of a grain of rice, are implanted within the body and then they just stay there. Uh, the patient just goes around with them. Um, and then the other flavor is high dose rate brachytherapy. And that is where uh, in the clinic, the radiation therapist will position these catheters um, around the tumor area. And then they actually, uh, in order to protect all the people as much as possible, use this instrument called an afterloader that literally shoots out uh, the radioactive seeds into place. They remain in place for a few minutes, the duration of the treatment, and then they're sucked back out again. Um, so that's uh, high dose rate brachytherapy. And we're gonna be talking about this one as well going forward. So um, one last piece of background that you're gonna to need to understand where we're going from here is how we measure radiation dose. So you usually see it in the medical physics world given in units of gray. And gray is just joules per kilogram. So it gives energy absorbed per kilogram of matter. You can also sometimes see um, energy per unit volume, which you then just convert using the density. Instead of dose, you'll sometimes hear the word KERMA, and KERMA is actually an acronym. It stands for kinetic energy released per unit mass. So that's another one uh, that you may hear. And then the last thing we need to define is um, how are we going to measure the dose enhancement due to nanoparticles? So this is something called a dose enhancement factor. It's just a simple ratio. So that's going to be the dose in gray to um, a uh, in this case, a phantom or some kind of sample that contains nanoparticles divided by the dose to that same sample that contains no nanoparticles. So it's just a simple enhancement ratio. Okay, so I think that's it for all the uh, medical physics background. Now you know everything you need to know. Um, and we can go on to ask the question, how do gold nanoparticles actually enhance radiation dose? So. Um, here, we're going to uh, go back to maybe this um, diagram that you've seen in like modern physics. There's many, many processes by which ionizing radiation, such as x-rays, can interact with matter. So here, we're showing incoming x-rays um, hitting, in this case, your um, metal nanoparticle, and all kinds of secondary products come uh, spraying out from photons to OJ electrons to photoelectrons and even pair production, um, positrons and electrons. So all of these processes can happen and they all have um, different likelihoods to happen for different energies and different masses of the um, atoms with which they're interacting. So um, we're gonna look here at this uh, useful chart. So this gives kind of the regions where different of these interaction effects will dominate as a function of photon energy for the incoming X-ray photons for um, different atomic numbers of the atoms that they're impinging on. And here I've got um, the dependence on Z, the atomic number of some of these different effects, photoelectric effect, Compton effect, um, which is not dependent on Z, and then the pair production. So we know that gold has an atomic number of 79, puts it up here um, near the top of this diagram. And what you uh, may have noticed is that for the radiation ther therapy modalities that I mentioned, the uh, brachytherapy that is um, in the range of like hundreds of KeV is gonna be placing for gold um, this approach in the region of this graph where the photoelectric effect is dominant. And then for the external beam radiation therapy, for the very highest energies, like 18 MeV and above, where this um, type of therapy can be done, you might be getting into the region where uh, pair production is dominant. So for those two modalities, we should be able to see some uh, enhancement of these processes, photoelectric effect, and pair production 
due to the presence of just these high Z number uh, gold atoms. So for our initial experimental study, we decided to try and um, zero in on the photoelectric effect since that's the one that can be enhanced the most. It goes as Z cubed. Um, and so we selected iridium-192 high dose rate brachytherapy as our initial sort of um, proof of concept study. So um, that is just a little bit about how the gold nanoparticles enhance radiation dose. The first thing that we did um, on this project was to try and calculate how much dose enhancement we could even expect from sort of realistic nanoparticle parameters that we can do in the lab. So like real concentrations, real shapes and sizes of nanoparticles that we can actually make. So to calculate that, we did some uh, Monte Carlo simulations. So um, we used a code called MCMP6. This is a uh, very uh, historical Monte Carlo code out of Los Alamos National Lab. It actually, um, versions of this date all the way back to the Manhattan Project, but today um, it's used not only at Los Alamos, but also in the medical physics community. And like other Monte Carlo codes, it's just a probabilistic model of radiation transport that at its core um, just gives you tons and tons of photon and electron trajectories. And we can calculate um, a bunch of cool things from this. So there's several ingredients that go into any Monte Carlo simulation of this type. So um, what are the inputs? What are the ingredients in our simulation? First, you have to just create um, the geometry of your system and input the um, material properties. Then you have to define your radiation source. So um, for these sort of simple simulations that we're doing, that consists of just giving the size and position of your radiation source um, and some information about the number and type of particles that it should emit. And the two most important definitions are the probability distribution of the energies emitted, which we know for things like um, those iridium 192 seeds or for our clinical linear accelerator, as well as the probability distribution of the angles that those particles are emitted at. And um, Monte Carlo simulations, named as they are after a casino, um, the idea is basically that you roll the dice and randomly sample those probability distributions to generate your trajectories for the emitted uh, photons and electrons, and then they go on to interact with the other materials in the simulation. Then the last ingredient in our MCMP simulations are the tallies. So um, this is MCMP's way of just calculating the different quantities that you can compute, such as particle fluxes or energy fluxes through a two-dimensional surface, or the amount of particles or the amount of energy deposited in a certain volume. So that's your, your dose or your kerma. So we set up these models for our two different setups. This is our um, external beam um, Linux setup, where we've got our radiation source, our collimators, our nanoparticle containing volume um, down at the bottom. And then we also made one for the iridium-192 brachytherapy setup, where we've got our uh, radioactive source inside of a catheter um, separated a large distance from our nanoparticle containing volume so that the uh, test volume is in charge particle equilibrium. And then our nanoparticle containing volume uh, was modeled just as a three-dimensional lattice of gold spheres in water. Uh, and these are gold spheres 30 nanometers in diameter um, at concentrations ranging from about 0.1 up to 1% by mass in the solution. And you're probably already thinking uh, a cubic lattice that's so unrealistic. Um, you're right. Uh, we're working on some more realistic spatial distributions of the nanoparticles currently. But however, as you'll see, even this uh, cubic lattice is, uh, does a pretty good job of giving us realistic dose enhancement values for the types of processes that we're looking at here. We validated these Monte Carlo models using uh, real equipment calibration data from the Cancer Center at UT Health San Antonio. And I wanted to show this because I think this might also be um, really interesting for those who are new to medical physics. So like what kind of data do they take on these 
um, clinical instruments. So for the external beam um, radiation therapy, so for the LINAC, they calibrate it using this um, giant water tank. So this is called a water phantom. So um, the word phantom in medical physics, this is kind of a funny one, right? It's October, it's spooky season. What's a phantom? It's like a ghost. No, um, a phantom in medical physics just means that um, this is some sort of sample that approximates the properties of tissue. Okay, so depending on what kind of um, processes you're looking at, um, you could choose a different type of phantom, but for these kinds of um, x-ray interactions, a pretty good representation of tissue is just water. So they use this kind of uh, water tank or giant water cube. There's also acrylic phantoms and different kinds of gel phantoms, but in general, for the kinds of processes we're trying to understand here, water is a pretty good stand-in for tissue. And there's two kinds of tests that they do. Um, the first one is called a percent depth dose curve. So here they just move a detector to different depths in the water phantom and measure the dose absorbed. Um, and this is generally what you want to see, that the dose absorbed is uh, peaked at some target depth and then falls off beyond that. And you can see our um, simulated and measured uh, curves match very well. And then the other calibration that they do is something called cross-line and inline profiles. So that's as you go in the X and the Y direction um, through your water phantom, what does the beam profile look like? And again, this is generally what you want. So once you've collimated your beam and done your beam shaping and filtering, you want just like a flat field um, of irradiation that covers your entire area and then falls off rapidly on the sides. And again, our simulation and um, real calibration data matched well. So that was the um, that was the uh, simulation. Now, how about the corresponding experiment? Um, so we um, devised a sort of uh, setup to measure the macroscopic physical dose enhancement due to the nanoparticles. Um, right. Sorry, I apologize, you guys, my slides are out of order. Um, okay, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So that was everything about the Monte Carlo simulations that we did to predict the dose enhancement. I'll show the results of those uh, in just a moment when we compare with experiment. Um, but we did do a series of experiments to uh, experimentally measure this dose enhancement as well. So in order to do that, we had to first prepare our gold nanoparticles. Um, for those of you who actually work with gold nanoparticles, you're probably gonna laugh because these are like the most basic nanoparticles you could ever imagine. So these are just citrate capped gold nanospheres. So we make these by Turkovich method. It's just the citrate reduction of gold chloride and water. Uh, and that produces a gold colloid made up of nanospheres. So um, the way it works is you just have a solution of um, sodium citrate and gold chloride in water. You heat it uh, with stirring. And after six or seven minutes, you get this color change um, to red and you have a solution of gold nanoparticles. Here's what they look like. They're very roughly speaking spherical. They're average of 30 nanometers in size. And if we take their um, optical spectrum, we can see that their uh, optical density is about one. From that, we can calculate their concentration using the known molar absorption coefficient and get that our nanoparticle concentration is about um, 0 0.18 nanomolar in that water. And for our medical physicist colleagues, they needed to know what does that equate to in terms of a mass percentage? And it turns out that that comes out to about 0.0029% gold by weight. And so our first challenge right off the bat was that our medical physicist colleagues told us um, we are never going to see any enhancement with that kind of a concentration. You got to bump it up. And so um, the fun task for one of my students when they told us this was to synthesize about two liters of gold nanoparticles and spend several days centrifuging them down into this 
a tiny amount of like nanoparticle sludge uh, to where the mass percent of gold was now high enough that they felt uh, we had a fighting chance to measure some actual enhancement. So um, how did they know to tell us that? How did they know to tell us we need this certain mass concentration in order to measure enhancement? Well, you can actually estimate it with just a pretty quick pencil and paper calculation. So let's estimate the gold concentration that you would need to see a 10% dose enhancement in terms of the radiation absorbed. So the dose is actually calculated just based on the energy fluence times this mass energy absorption coefficient for the material divided by the density. And then the dose enhancement factor is going to be the, um, again, dose to the nanoparticle solution over the dose to water. And uh, you can do just a simple estimate by just using um, the mass fraction of each component in your solution or mixture. So we're just going to do the coefficient for gold times the mass fraction of gold plus the coefficient for water times the mass fraction of water. And by doing this um, simple estimate, you would figure out that you need about 3% gold by mass to measure a 10% dose enhancement. So that was kind of our, our target was to get at least um, a high enough mass percent uh, experimentally to where we were pretty confident we'd be able to measure a significant change in the dose absorbed. Okay. So here's the slide that I thought I was going to, and that is how to measure the dose enhancement. So our idea was we're going to measure the dose in a water phantom with gold nanoparticles and without gold nanoparticles. We're going to divide those two numbers and get the dose enhancement factor. And we tried, and I'm kind of sharing this in, in a narrative, um, again, for the students so that you guys can know that you're not alone in your research struggles. We tried a bunch of different dosimeters before finding something that worked reliably for this. Um, so we started with some common radiation dosimeters. We tried TLDs and OSLDs. These are some of the types of radiation detectors that you would get like in one of those little radiation badges that you might have to wear into certain labs. Um, the problem with both of these is that in order to really measure the dose due to the gold nanoparticles, we needed to be able to place the actual active detection element right into that solution because we knew that the, uh, that the enhancement due to the nanoparticles would be co-localized with the nanoparticles. So the nanoparticles needed to be able to get like right up onto the detection medium. And that unfortunately destroyed uh, both of these detector types. And so um, this wouldn't really work to capture that localized dose enhancement due to the nanoparticles. So then the next thing we tried was a really old school solution. We used radiocomic film. So actual film, it's literally made by Kodak um, that uh, ended up working really well for this because you could literally just put a droplet of nanoparticle solution onto the film itself. Um, and so this was the little apparatus that we devised to measure the enhancement. So we've got a little well down here that holds a small piece of film and you have a fluid volume of nanoparticles both above and below the film. You place a uh, radioactive seed, one of those from the Iridium-192 brachytherapy, a uh, pretty large distance away, seven centimeters, so that um, the uh, detector will be in charge particle equilibrium. Um, and then we would irradiate for our uh, desired dosage. And then we'd read the film using a special scanner that they have over there in the clinic and then compare uh, what we get with the nanoparticle solution versus just pure water. And um, we were really excited. It seemed like this um, film method was really gonna work. And then um, we did our first big trial and we saw absolutely nothing. And we were really stumped because we had done um, both the Monte Carlo simulations as well as that hand calculation I showed on the previous slide. And we knew that we ought to be able to see um, just at a rudimentary level, some enhancement due to the nanoparticles. And so we were scratching our heads about what was going on. And then we realized something really silly, which is that of course, Iridium-192 not only does it emit x-rays, it also emits beta particles, also known as electrons. And how does the radiochromic film detect the dose? 
it detects the electrons. So we are picking up not only the secondary electrons being produced in the medium, but also the electrons that were coming right out of our radiation source. And that was completely washing out anything due to the nanoparticles themselves. So our solution was we just uh, put a little acrylic sleeve around our radioactive seed. So that blocks the uh, electrons emitting from the seed. The x-rays pass through no problem. And so once we had removed that electron contamination, all of a sudden we started getting answers that made sense for our um, dose to the nanoparticles and dose to the water. So again, that's just a, sort of an anecdote, like that's sort of the process of research, right? You, you make progress, you find another obstacle, and then you just keep going. So um, once we had ironed out all the problems with this apparatus, we did the experiment, as I described, measurement with the nanoparticle solution and then with water and then calculate the dose enhancement ratio. And here's what we found. We got dose enhancements of 1.6, 2.9, and 3.9% for gold nanoparticle solutions of these different um, mass concentrations. So this was pretty exciting because um, the enhancements are modest, but we measured them repeatedly. We showed that they were significant and uh, best of all, it agreed well with both our analytical calculation. So that uh, short hand calculation I showed, which is the red line right here, along with our three experimental data points, and then as well, our Monte Carlo simulations. So the Monte Carlo is the black and the experimental is the white um, circles on this graph. So we felt like, okay, we really um, understand well now the um, macroscopic physical dose enhancement due to the nanoparticle um, at brachytherapy energies. So um, this was uh, very encouraging to us. Um, and then just for completeness sake, we also went through and did the same thing for the external beam setup. So that was the one, um, if I can remind you, where we said, okay, if we do external beam irradiation at like the highest energy they have in the clinic, which is 18 MeV, we're hoping to get into this pair production region, which again should be enhanced in the presence of gold nanoparticles, and we hope to see some dose enhancement. So we made another little rig to measure this. Um, we just made like a, a acrylic sandwich, again, used our uh, well with gold nanoparticles above and below the film, stuck it in the uh, LINAC in the clinic, zapped it and measured with and without nanoparticles. And we saw uh, for the highest radiation um, energy measured and the highest nanoparticle concentration measured, we got a, a small but measurable and significant enhancement. So the highest one that we got was about a depth of 1.02, so about 2% enhancement with 1.3% gold by mass at 18 uh, megavoltage um, beam. We also tried the six megavoltage beam and we saw no significant enhancement. As well with lower concentrations of gold, we saw no significant enhancement. So that kind of matched what we thought. Um, for the external beam, we're not going to get very much enhancement. And in order to see it, we really have to up the nanoparticle concentration and up the energy. Um, but we just wanted to really um, fully explore that parameter space and just make sure that we understood what was going on. So again, we had good agreement between our measured and our Monte Carlo. And so we feel pretty confident now that we're good at measuring the physical dose in both apparatuses with our nanoparticles. OK. so. Um, up till now, everything we've been talking about is macroscopic physical dose enhancement. So we're measuring um, the dose to that volume containing a concentration of nanoparticles and the enhancements that we see in those kind of volumes goes up to about like between four to 5% max um, for what we've been able to see so far for nanoparticle concentrations that are realistically achievable experimentally. But the thing you have to keep in mind is that this is the dose to the entire volume, the way that we measure it. So it's a volume average. So you have to imagine that um, the dose that you're measuring for that nanoparticle solution, it includes the nanoparticles themselves, 
the region right outside the nanoparticle surface where most of those um, secondary products are going to be produced. But as well, it includes all the volume of just water that's in between the nanoparticles. So you can easily imagine that the dose enhancement, if you could just measure the immediate region outside of the nanoparticle surface, could be much higher. And that could be really important to understand for the therapeutic application, because the important thing is actually not what is the average uh, radiation dose throughout a volume. The important thing is what is the radiation dose right there at the nucleus of the cancer cell where its DNA is. So if you could co-locate the nanoparticles in or on the cancer cells close enough to the nucleus to get the higher dose in that region where the DNA is, that might be all you need. So it's really important to um, highlight the difference, the distinction between macroscopic physical dose enhancement and the microscopic dose enhancement that is the super important one for the radiobiological effects. And just um, to show an example, this is a calculation uh, that Tara, the lead grad student on this project did. Um, it's another Monte Carlo showing the microscopic dose distribution outside of one nanosphere. And it shows that the majority of the dose deposited here as you move out radially uh, from the center of the gold nanoparticle occurs within the first 100 nanometers of the nanoparticle surface. And in fact, um, I would argue that most of the dose here is getting deposited within the first like 10 or 20. So um, that really encourages us that maybe, you know, even though we're getting just 4% enhancement uh, as the volume average, we might be able to get much higher enhancements um, in small localized regions. And understanding this is going to be critical to understanding the radiobiological effects. Okay. So how are we going to measure the radiobiological effects? Um, the simplest one that we can measure is just cell viability. So I'm going to start talking now about in vitro studies. So irradiating cells and just measuring cell viability. So before and after the treatment, what's the percent of live versus dead cells? And you can quantify the radiobiological effects in terms of another one of these ratios, this one called the radiosensitization enhancement factor or the RAF. So this is kind of similar to the dose enhancement factor, DEF, but it's um, a little more complicated. Here's the way it works. You would pick a target value for cell survival. So for example, let's say your target was 60% cell viability, meaning that 60% um, of the cells are uh, live and the other 40% are killed. Then um, you need to answer the question, what radiation dose is needed to produce that cell survival percentage with and without the nanoparticles. So what you need to do is irradiate, add a few different doses, interpolate between them, figure out what exact dose would correlate to cell survival of 60%, and then compare that number with nanoparticles versus without nanoparticles. So here um, is just the shorthand equation form of what I just said in words. Um, this is how we're going to define the radio sensitization enhancement factor. And the first thing that we did was um, a pilot study where we just wanted to find out, um, can we measure this effect at all? Um, and so our initial experiment was based on a cell line called C33A. These are cervical cancer cells that were incubated with gold nanoparticles for 24 hours. Um, this is some confocal microscopy showing dark field of the nanoparticles, bright field of the cells, and then both of these layered together. So you can see these cells are chock full of our uh, gold nanoparticles. And the radiation modality that we chose for our initial pilot study was um, the external beam at the high energy. That was the one where we saw the uh, max 2% macroscopic dose enhancement. And I'm going to be honest, the reason we chose this for the pilot study was purely practical. This was the one that was the, the easiest for us to uh, be allowed to use in the cancer center. So what we did was we um, actually placed the uh, um, six well plates with the cultured cells right above the LENAC head. LENAC head is upside down here. And we hit it with 
um, zero, three, or six gray of uh, radiation using the 18 megavoltage beam. We did uh, samples both with and without nanoparticles in the cells, and we measured the cell viability before and after using tripan blue assay. And this is what we got. So we did we measured the radio sensitization enhancement for two different um, surviving fractions, the 60% and also the 30%. And what we found is that for our um, gold concentration, uh, our gold nanoparticle concentration that corresponded to 0.15% by mass, we got radio sensitization enhancement of 11.5%. So this was really exciting because um, if you remember for the macroscopic physical dose enhancement for this modality, it was only max 2%. And that was for way more gold. That was for 1.3% by mass. So here we have almost 10 times less gold and we have a much larger enhancement factor for the um, cell killing ability of this treatment. So this is great, right? We're done. We can just like pack up and go home. We've solved radiation therapy. Um, only no, right? Obviously there's still so much more to learn so many more questions we have to answer. Um, so our ongoing work is now trying to go back and understand some more of the details about what's going on here. So the first prong of our ongoing work is to really um, probe the nanoparticle cell interactions more in detail. So we're looking at um, a couple different cell lines, cervical cancer and liver, liver cancer cells, as well as their corresponding normal cell lines, because we wanna check everything that we're doing um, testing cancer cells, we want to do the same test on normal cells because ideally, um, hopefully the uh, nanoparticle interactions will not damage the normal cells. And we're measuring um, three different things. We want to know the effects of the nanoparticles on cell viability, which we're using an assay called Zombie Aqua to measure. And we want to know uh, more than just cell viability, like are the cells dead or not, we want to know if they're dead, how and why are they dead? So we're studying apoptosis and necrosis using an assay called Anexin 5 pi um, And so the, here's some actual biophysics, guys. Um, Anexin 5 pi assay works in the following way. In a healthy cell, you can see the lipid bilayer membrane is made up of a bunch of different types of lipids. But in particular, the lipids called phosphatidylserine or PS lipids, they live on the inner leaflet of the membrane. Um, However, when the cell starts to get sick and undergo apoptosis, some of those PS lipids flip around to the outer leaflet, then a Nexum 5 probe can attach, and that signal indicates the cell is undergoing early apoptosis. Then uh, once the cell has actually undergone apoptosis and it's necrotic, it's got holes in the membrane and propidium iodide can permeate through, and now we see propidium iodide probe inside the cell. So that's a really um, neat assay to study what's going on um, at a very detailed level with the cell apoptosis. And then the third thing we're studying is reactive oxygen species using an assay called DCSCA. Um, and this is going to be super important when we start adding the um, irradiation back in uh, because reactive oxygen species is um, the way that the radiation induces the DNA damage and cell death in the cancer cells. So we're first um, studying all of these, again, just for the nanoparticles and cells alone without radiation to make sure we have a really good handle on the nanoparticle cell interactions. And then we're going to add back um, the irradiation. So we're doing all this analysis using imaging flow cytometry. This is a really powerful technique that um, allows you to gather data from uh, multiple uh, probes or multiple channels in one single experiment. And it also gives you single cell information, which is really cool. So I wanted to show you just one example of the type of data we can get from this. Um, so this is for C33A cells incubated with pegylated nanoparticles. And um, in this one experiment, the flow cytometer measured 12,000 total cells. So each of these lines is a single cell. And we have here um, three channels of data. The first channel is a Nexum 5, um, your early apoptosis marker. Second channel is, next, is a PI, the late apoptosis slash necrosis marker. And then the third column here is the two of those added together. 
And um, the flow cytometer collects this data on all 12,000 cells. And then by histogramming the signal intensity from these different channels, you can actually batch the cells or divide them into these different subpopulations. And so here we divided the cells into three groups. So cells that show neither Anexin-5 nor PI. So these are healthy cells. Cells that show Anexin-5 only. These are early apoptotic. And then cells that show both Anexin-5 and PI. So these are the late stage apoptosis slash necrosis group. So this is the kind of level of detailed information that we can get out from this technique. And we're hoping to learn a lot more about the nanoparticle cell interactions from this. And then of course, um, once we've uh, completed this study on the nanoparticle cell interactions alone, we want to do the same level of depth on the radiobiological effects. And so this is also our ongoing work. We wanna compare all of these um, effects. So the viability, the apoptosis stuff, and the reactive oxygen species between both cancerous and normal cells with and without nanoparticles and with and without the irradiation. We also wanna study this for both modalities. So we showed the pilot study, which was done with external beam. Um, my student Shaquan is currently working with the brachytherapy and he's designed this um, apparatus here where it's just a, um, a small centrifuge tube that holds your nanoparticle solution with your film. And then it's got four of these catheters. So he shoots in four of the radioactive seeds surrounding the, um, the phantom. Uh, he can calculate the dose distribution using their treatment planning software. Um, it's really cool work that Shaquan has done on that. And so um, for these studies in the brachytherapy modality, we're also doing um, these different in vitro assays. So we're looking to, again, determine the effects of the nanoparticle enhanced radiation on the viability, the apoptosis and necrosis pathway, and then the reactive oxygen species concentration. And then here's just an example of Shaquan's recent data from this part of the project. So here we have, again, the cervical cancer cells that have been treated with a combination of pegylated nanoparticles plus the iridium-192 irradiation in that brachytherapy setup I just showed you. And here we've got three channels from um, the single cell data from the image flow cytometer. The first one is reactive oxygen species. So this is the DCFDA dye. Um, second channel here, this is actually side scattering. So that's pretty cool. It shows you um, the actual scattering of the gold nanoparticles. And then the third channel here is the zombie aqua stain that shows you live dead. So again, um, the cells were divided into two classes, live and dead cells. So you can see the live cells here show um, the presence of reactive oxygen species um, that came about because of the treatment. Um, although these are uh, not dead yet, um, you can see the presence of the nanoparticles inside the cells. And then for the dead cells population, you can also see that um, zombie aqua stain indicating that they are killed. Okay. So that's all the data I've brought for you guys today. Um, in conclusion, to wrap up, I can summarize that we've characterized the macroscopic physical dose enhancement due to the gold nanoparticles really thoroughly with both um, Monte Carlo simulations and experiments for both brachytherapy and external beam modalities. And we found that the maximum dose enhancements we were able to get with our um, concentrations of nanoparticles achievable in the lab were about four to 5% for the brachy and then one to 2% for the external beam uh, modalities. We also learned that understanding the microscopic dose enhancement is gonna be essential for the clinical application. Um, and our pilot study showed that you can get radio sensitization enhancement of 11.5% uh, for the external beam. And I think we can push those numbers much higher um, by really selecting um, suitable modalities and experimental parameters. Our ongoing work is really focused in these radiobiological effects now. Um, so looking at not only the nanoparticle cell interactions themselves, but also what happens um, when you irradiate in terms of those um, in vitro assays that we talked about. And of course, um, I and the whole team have so much more to learn. Uh, it's an exciting project every day. Um, so with that, I think I'm done, although if you guys will allow, um, I do have one
quick advertisement I would like to share. Um, so if after all you've heard, you're not um, totally turned off, you can come and work with me uh, at UTSA. So this is mostly for the postdocs. And if you guys know any recent PhD graduates, uh, we're looking to hire two new faculty members in my department at UTSA to start next fall. We're looking for one astronomer and then one person in materials physics, which is quite broadly defined. So if you're interested in that, go to our department website, scroll all the way down to the bottom and you can see uh, the link to apply. So definitely wanna get that out there, check it out. Um, and that is it. Thank you guys so much.